Hi, welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety. I want to let you know the SAG After Foundation has a COVID 19 relief fund to support SAG After artists mm -hmm. with basic needs like rent, food, and healthcare costs during this global pandemic and industry shutdown. Donations are 100% tax deductible and directly support performers in need. Information on how you can support this effort can be found in the description of this video. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Lena Olin and Tom Dolby. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, this is primarily an audience of SAG after actors who, who watch these. So I actually always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? I think I got it. I must have gotten it because I was kind of... Did I get, I think I got it as soon as I could first, my first American movie was The Unbearable Lightness of Being, which we shot basically in Europe. Uh, Tom, have you ever dabbled in acting? I know you're the writer producer, I'm sorry, writer director of this film and uh, a, a very prominent producer. Uh, did acting ever interest you? Uh, you know, not, not really. I think I always wanted to be on more of the storytelling, writing, writing and directing side of things. That being said, I've got my, the producer of my last movie, um, last weekend, uh, Mark Johnson, who is a, a very big producer, gave me terrific advice. He said, I said, what should I do in preparation for directing my first film? And he said, go take some acting classes. And I took this intensive three-day workshop and it was fabulous. It was so fun, but I also really understood, I got a refresher in like what, what an actor goes through in that process. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. I tell a lot of uh, directors that and a lot of actors actually um, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. a lot of the great directors I worked with like Pollock who I realized started as an actor and a lot of the a lot of, you know he would come up and talk to you about something and you realize how much he knows from inside of the process and and then I was like of course he started as an actor and he was very devastated I think not to be able to keep on acting and and when people asked him, do you want to teach? Do you want to drink? Do you want to? He was very hurt. And then, of course, as he did his late in life, he did his amazing performances as an actor. He was a great actor. Yeah. Um, so I want to start at the beginning with The Artist's Wife. Uh, Tom, this is your second feature film as director. You also co-wrote the screenplay. Um, what made you want to tell this story? I was really interested in the idea of a creative couple, a marriage between two creative people, and, and what happens when, you know, it's so often the, the, the wife, the woman, um, who sadly has to give up her career or her, her career slows down in favor of supporting her husband. And, and we've seen many stories where this has happened, but it's usually from the perspective of the husband primarily. And I thought, let's, what if we see what is life like for her? And so that was, that was very interesting. And then this crisis that hits you know, Claire and Richard with, with his dementia coming on, um, is, it was really just this catalyst for, for Claire to, to change her whole life, really. And Lena, how did the role of Claire find its way to you, and, and what interested you in playing her? Um, well, I was sent the script. I was, uh, I was doing stage work in Sweden at the time. I was doing uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I played Martha in Stockholm <laughs> at the National, and we were rehearsing and when I stay in Stockholm, I stay in our house in outside of Stockholm. So I, I, I rode to rehearsal in a boat and the boat ride was quite long and I read the script <laughs> and there was something about how powerful she was and how she found her power, which I think was so inspiring and also so relatable because I think a lot of the times, mostly women, we tend to, without even knowing, leave behind parts of who we are because we want things to work. We want, we want to be there for the people we love and we need it because we need to care for someone else or just, just I think, wanting it to work, I think is, is, is often the reason why we, without even knowing, have given up parts of ourselves. And I think that's what's happened to Claire, for sure. And then this, this, this tragedy that strikes brings her back to, forces her to, to, to sort of get in touch with who she is and who she was. And I think that's very empowering and, 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 and relatable. Oh, yeah, I think everyone can relate to this idea, uh, even though it's a very specific story about 
an artist who, who sort of gave up her career um, for her husband. But I feel like it resonates for so many reasons. And I know all work is personal. All these movies you make are personal in some way. But did this resonate um, with both of you personally? Yes, very much for me, because I, you know, um, my mother, who was an actor, I, I grew up, my parents were both actors. My dad was a director, writer, and, and, and my mom was an actor. And my, when my dad got very sick, and my mom um, had three kids, and she, I feel like she said, I don't want to do it. I don't care about it. I don't need to be in front of the camera. But she had fought very hard to become, and she was a movie star in Sweden at a very young age, and she got married at a young age. And she would always deny that she even wanted it. She was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to do it anymore. But I think she, she, life called, you know, life asked her to do something and she replied and she, she did it and she took care of the kids and, and my father and, and, and made it work. So I think she was a, a glorious example of, 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 of giving up parts of who you are. Luckily mm -hmm. for me, she did, but it's, but it, but she was also so empowering and so inspiring, and I think she had this quiet strength that was amazing. Mm -hmm. Tom, for you? Yeah, yeah it, it definitely was for me. My my father had um, dementia before before he died, and I saw what my mother re went through in terms of supporting him and caring for him, um, and also really like the shame and guilt and kind of uh, embarrassment that comes in the early stages of, of the diagnosis. And this is so much of what Claire is going through. Um, is, she's, Claire is totally alone. I mean, the, the, the one thing we always noted in the development of script is like, Claire has almost no friends. Like she, can, the house, she confides in the housekeeper, you know, which is so interesting. And she has sort of, you know, art world friends, but there's more like professional relationships. Um, so it, was you know this seeing this very lonely thing my mother has has a lot of wonderful friends of course but you know it's like is when can you feel comfortable sharing and saying you know my my partner is going through this and i don't know how to deal with it you know that's a big bold step uh the film is set in this very specific world of art and artists um did you know that world already did did either of you have to take on any sort of research to understand this world because it feels very authentic Thank you. Um, I, I knew it a bit. Um, I had, had lived out in the Hamptons briefly um, when I was going back and forth between, between New York City and there. Um, I studied art history in college, and so I've always loved the art world and, and, and sort of that milieu and movies, movies about, about art and artists. Um, so that part, of it, that part of it was familiar to me. What about actually playing a painter? We get to see, you know, Claire actually at work and it's very convincing. I don't know if that's actually you. Um, if it is, I'd like to buy your paintings. I love those final ones. <laughs> uh, I actually have, and I think it was you, Tom, who pointed it out. I've played a painter many times in my career. You have! My first uh, American film, The Unbearable Likeness of Being, I played a painter. And then I did the Swedish film uh, where I played a painter and I will play a painter because um, my husband Lasse Hallström is a director and he's writing a, a, a screenplay about the Swedish painter Hilmar Klint who now has success but had a very very tough life and was not recognized or her art wasn't when she was alive so so I have I, I'm good at pretending to paint but I couldn't paint <laughs> but uh, and I, I have shadowed or sort of asked to be with painters and watch them paint and see how they go about their day and of course it varies so much it's like acting or directing like everyone does it so differently but it's been interesting to follow that particular art form and see how they how they approach it how they deal with it how they struggle and how they it, it, it's kind of similar in the preparation work of an actor, I would say, uh, but then of course the technique is is so is so different. But when it comes to the art world, I was because I think it was you, Tom, who who connected me with some people who are art dealers and the whole business mm -hmm. side of art. Because I think innocently, like art is like in a museum, and some people are <laughs> painting, but you don't think of the economic side to it. And I think that's also part, which is an interesting part of the story, how they're about to have. He is preparing a show, which financially is huge. 
because he is such a famous painter. And she also realizes that if we tell the world that he's sick and he cannot paint, she kind of, I think that's also part of it, that she has mm -hmm. to, they have to make it work because it's, it's a big, big financial thing for them that he actually pulls it off. Uh, so, so, and that's an interesting part of the art world that we don't think about how, and I watched all the documentaries that are so interesting. And, and I think like most, I think most people are not in that world. Think of it so innocently that we don't yeah. understand the hype of Sunday. One artist is like three million dollars. And it's like, where did that come from? Uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, and, and interesting. Uh, we obviously have to talk about this amazing ensemble um, in this film, starting with Bruce Dern, who plays your husband, Richard. Um, I don't even, he, you know, he's, he's very picky about his roles. I know that at, at this point in his career. Um, did you think about him when you were writing it? Did you know he might be interested? How, how did you go about, uh, I don't want to say convincing because it's such a good part. I can see why he did it. But, you know, how did you well, even know? Uh, we did have a little help from someone named Laura Dern, who was actually <laughs> familiar with the script. And I had a coffee with her a while back and um, we were interested in, you know, working on something, you know, and hopefully we will in the future. And I texted her when we went out to Bruce and I said, you know, we're going to your dad for Richard. And she texted me right back. She said, oh my God, he has to do it. I'm calling him right now. And literally we heard back the next day. So that's kind of like your dream, your dream scenario, you know, of um, how, you know, how, how you hope it, how you hope it goes. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there was something that touched him very deeply about, about this script. And, you know, a lot of, uh, some of those things that are in the script about paint what breaks your heart and that kind of thing. Those are actually things that Bruce already says just by chance. He talks a lot about, you know, it's all coming from here and you know he's really a very a very sensitive man um he has so many different sides to him you know people see sort of the gruff rough and tumble kind of guy but he's a very sensitive guy and lena you guys really feel like this lived in marriage for better or for worse um did you know him at all before filming it again did that chemistry just sort of happen i didn't know him and and i remember tom and i talked about it and 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 first of all, I thought it's, it's so cool because this film is called The Artist's Wife. And I think that too, a lot of <laughs> actors are like the artist's wife. <laughs> <It's not laughs> but when we started working together, the first time the slate goes and, and camera is rolling, Bruce is something else. And it's so refreshing and so inspiring. And you just have to dive in there and and roll with it what we want to do as actors we want to react authentically and be present with ourselves as the character and and i think bruce just forces you to do that because yeah. he just throws things at you and and you mm -hmm. you swim or you sink and 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 swimming means that you are in the you're present in the situation and you just react as claire would react to what he does He's extremely inspiring. And like Tom said, he's also such a sweet, sweet, loving man. And you feel very loved by Bruce. And, and that's important as an actor that you feel, you feel, you know, it's very, um, you, you need to feel safe uh, with the people you work with. And, and Bruce is such a great example of a man who, who, who you feel very safe with working with. Um, not asking you to name names or, or movies or anything like that, but have you ever been in a situation where you didn't feel safe and, and how do you sort of navigate that as an actor? Uh, or maybe, you know, the chemistry just wasn't there. Sometimes yeah. things are off and I, I guess that's where acting comes in. Yeah. <laughs> but that's <laughs> sort of what, what we aspire to do as actors is to just be present as and sort of draw from ourselves and, and if you have to, 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 to act it, that, that's sort of what we're paid for, I think, not to act, mm. uh, to, be, to be using who we are and lend ourselves to the story, to the character. And it's really tricky if it's someone you're not so hot on or so <laughs> impressed by. Um, and, and, and that's difficult. And you, mm. just have to, you just have to march on, I guess. But it's, it, 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 it's so wonderful to work when it's someone 
you really feel that you respect and you, you feel the, the, the mutual respect and, and love. And, uh, and that stays with you forever. It may be decades after I work with someone who I have that kind of connection with and you meet again and it's like, there you are, you know, and it's right back at where you want it to be. Uh, you also have some other terrific scene partners. I'm a big fan of Juliet Rylance, who I, who I don't often get to see on screen. She's so busy in the theater. And Avin uh, Jogia, uh, who uh, well, I don't want to give too much away about the movie if people haven't seen it, but it, but he's he's the babysitter um, and really fantastic. Uh, I'm just sort of curious about how you how you went about um, creating this ensemble. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you are you're built. It's like you're building out this family sort of. And um, I had really admired Juliet's work in um, primarily in in a few indie films that I saw, and uh, and then I looked into a little more what she had done, and um, and she really felt felt right for this. And I think she brought that, this combination of sort of having a wall up, but this vulnerability at the same time, which is so important for Angela. Um, the story with Avin is sort of was sort of interesting. I had seen him in this in this indie film um, with uh, starring uh, it was him with uh, Ethan Hawke and Asa Butterfield called Ten Thousand Saints. And I mean, this was like years ago, like four years earlier or something. And I thought I really like that kid. I mean, he was like I don't know twenty or eighteen or something at the time. And I just there was something that stuck in my head. And then he had submitted an, an audition tape and. Uh, and I somehow recognized him and I was, I sort of made, I really liked the audition tape and then I made the connection of like, oh my God, that's the one that I thought, oh, keep, keep my eye on. And so we had to have him, you know, I just had to have him and it was like, he had to fly in like five different times and he was shooting another film, I think in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, at, at the end though, everybody was like, it was worth it. I'm glad you fought, even though it was, a little, you know, logistically challenging, it's, I'm glad you fought for, you know, for this to work. And uh, I know you're making a movie on probably an independent schedule and budgets. Um, you you're also have scenes out in the snow. Um, I'm sort of curious, both logistically and maybe, Lena, from an acting standpoint, what were the biggest challenges for each of you? I think time is, is, is what's mm -hmm. tough with independent movies, that you want time, you want to explore, you want to go further. And I know Tom is a perfectionist like myself you you know <laughs> want to you you want to see is there and is there a little bit we could have and then time is your enemy and 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 on a, on an indie film on any film i mean <laughs> it's not wish we could just go on forever but uh i think that is the, the the tough thing that you know we have this window and we need to get it done and and i think we share that with most directors, actors, crew, everyone who, who wants to get it done. And, and with any indie film, everyone is there because they love the project, I guess. Uh, and and uh, you just want to get it done and you want to get it done perfectly. And it's sometimes really hard with time and light and you just have to take the opportunity. And, and I know when it started snowing and Tom was like, just let, let's just shoot it. So it's not in the script and it's not in our oh, day. Yeah. I love that. Oh, oh, beautiful because there was snow, snow, snow coming down. And, and he said, that just throw something on, get up on the top floor. Yeah. And yes. We'll shoot you yeah. and we'll see the snow. And we see, and I think that was a really beautiful scene that we got, you know, so you have to be scrappy and, 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 and I think that's the hard part that we don't have all the time we want. Yeah, I thought you planned that snow. It looks so gorgeous. <laughs> no, it was amazing. And we had we had um, Catherine Curtin in literally for one day, and it yes. was snowing for the first half of the day. And it was like the, everyone was kind of standing around. And I got into the house, and it was like, okay, just you know, send send Lena over here, and you know, put her in a sweater. We kind of joke and call it like the sweater movie because there were so many sweaters she was in. And, you know, they're like, which sweater? Which scene is this? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to shoot some vignettes and it actually provided that incredible transition yeah. between her making the big decision she makes, you know, in the end. Um, but yeah, you have to be scrappy and you have to, it's time, it's location, all the locations and the time it takes to get there and unload and all that, all that stuff. Um, I mean, one of my favorite stories is like we were, we were of course running against the clock and, 
And Lena, Lena said, you know, I want to hold in this scene. I want to be holding something or folding something. And I was wearing like a turtleneck with a shirt over it like this. And I took off my shirt and I just gave it to her. And I said, here, there's your prop. And she's like, great. You know, <laughs> so it was the shirt off my back. <laughs> Literally. I love that. <laughs> um, Alina, I wanted to ask you because you have played so many genres and so many roles, stage and screen. Um, is there anything you haven't played yet that you'd like to do? Uh you only need one. But the, 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 every time when it, when it happens again and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so blessed. Once again, I, I have that rush and that's, and that's amazing and it's such a blessing. So I think there's a thousand things out there that I do want to play and that is probably waiting for me. <laughs> Um, before we go, I want to remind everyone this movie is actually coming out next week. Um, it'll be September 25th. Um, it's actually my birthday, so um, I'll tell everyone that they need to go see it. <laughs> but uh, you have done the festival circuit. You've shown this movie. What, what does it feel like for it finally to be coming out for the world to see? It's amazing for it to come out. I mean, it's been a long road. We thought we were coming out in April, and then we decided to postpone and two days later, the theater's closed anyway. And so we, you know, it didn't matter, you know, if we had decided whatever. But um, I think sometimes there's a sort of a long, a long road. And, and when you love a project and you really believe in it, it doesn't matter like how long it is. Um, you just stick with it. And I mean, I'm, I'm so enthusiastic and so proud of this film. It's, uh, it's a really special movie, and the performances are so wonderful. Um, and on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, we just want to thank you both for joining us, um, sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performing artists. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us.